Just good morning, everyone, and welcome to, I think this is our third in a series of updates provided by the AIDS Institute. And I'm very pleased to have both uh, Mr. Rupel and Mr. Smith on the line with us today. I'm going to introduce both speakers. They will transition through the talk, and uh, both will dialogue with us. Michael Rupel is the Executive Director of the AIDS Institute, a national HIV AIDS organization with a mission to promote action for social change through public policy research, advocacy, and education. The AIDS Institute's program and administrative offices are located in Tampa, Florida at the University of South Florida College of Medicine, and their national policy office is in Washington, D.C. For the past 15 years, Mr. Rubel has functioned in senior management for the nonprofit sector, developing, man developing, managing, and providing HIV AIDS support services in various capacities, including case management, supportive housing services, rental assistance, food pantry, financial management, and job placement. Mr. Rubel has an extensive background in financial and business management and program and project development. Since transitioning into working with HIV AIDS service organizations, he has developed and supervised advocacy and outreach programs, research projects, prevention services, food service programs, comprehensive financial assistance services, direct housing and housing assistance programs, volunteer programs, special events, and fundraising services. Carl Schmidt was named the Deputy Executive Director of the AIDS Institute, a national public policy advocacy and research organization in June 2009. Prior to that, he served as the Institute's Director of Federal Affairs, a position he held since February 2004. Prior to joining the AIDS Institute, he served as a consultant to a number of HIV, AIDS, and civil rights organizations. He has worked in Washington for over 20 years and began his public policy work in the, in the energy arena, which continued through 2003. Mr. Schmidt is the co-convener of AIDS in America, a coalition of national AIDS organizations that focus on federal HIV policy, co-chair of the AIDS Budget and Appropriations Coalition, a convening group member of the Federal AIDS Policy Partnership, and co-chair of an HIV testing reimbursement work group. He is a former chair of the HIV Prevention Action Coalition and the Ryan White Reauthorization Work Group. He remains active in those coalitions, along with others that advocate for Medicaid, Medicare, and health care reform, the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, and hepatitis issues. He was a member of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS from 2007 to 2009 and chaired its domestic subcommittee. In 2010, he was named by Pause Magazine as one of the 100 most effective AIDS fighters in the nation and was recently named by Whitman Walker Health as one of the 25 individuals who have played prominent roles in the fight against HIV AIDS in DC for over the past 25 years. Mr. Schmidt earned his BA in Public Affairs and an MBA in International Affairs from the George Washington University in Washington, DC. It's a pleasure to have you both join us today, and um, whoever is going to start, I will turn the uh, presentation over to you. Thank you, Dr. Beal. This is Michael. Um, we're going to kick off, um, well, actually, we're going to cover two different areas. We're going to cover our um, snapshot of our federal um, activities and, and then a brief discussion about um, what's happening at, at the state level, um, which I'll wrap up with. Um, but first, I want to um, introduce uh, Carl. Carl runs our, our National Policy Office, um, and he also manages our portfolio of uh, policy issues, of which he's going to cover a, a lot of the top line issues that are going to be important to you um, right now and certainly um, important to our patients. Um, so thank you. And um, I'm passing this on to Carl. Okay, well, thank you, Michael, and it's good to be back with everyone. 
uh, for our third session. Um, so today I'm going to be uh, talking about some of an update on federal funding levels for HIV and hepatitis programs. I think in our first one we uh, gave uh, um, a background there. And just to bring everyone up to speed on what's happened in the last couple of months and what we expect. Um, for the rest of the year, and then talk about some recent federal policy changes that will impact both patients and providers. And finally, um, on what you can do as patients and providers to become more involved at the federal level. And Michael will then talk about some of these uh, same issues at um, the state level. So first, um, a re an update on funding levels for HIV AIDS programs and hepatitis um, programs. I think last time we got together, I talked about sequestration, the overall budget levels, and how that is impacting individual HIV and hepatitis programs. Um, since then, the, um, the budget has been decided on um, but in the House and the Senate and the President. He has sent his budget to the Congress, and they are now considering the uh, individual program uh, specifics. And uh, the way Congress works is they split up the budget into different subcommittees. And most of our programs are in labor, HHS, uh, that's Health and Human Services. And also the HOPA program is in the HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Subcommittee. Different subcommittees, different budget levels. So just top line, um, the, what has been decided so far is the, for the Senate and the labor HHS bill, it's going to be the same level overall as last year. And then uh, for the House, it's going to be $1 billion, that's B, with a, a, a B, a billion dollars less than last year. So they have to come up with their individual um, bills living in those levels. And um, we, with their activity has not yet begin, begun on the, uh, that bill in the House but it has begun in the Senate, and I'll talk about that as we go forward. On the HUD bill, the HUD spending levels and the HOPA program, they have moved a little faster, and that will be reflected in the slides. So now looking at individual program levels uh, for CDC HIV prevention uh, for the last couple of years. And uh, in FY11, yeah, to FY12, you can see we got a increase, um, and that was mainly because the president has um, has prioritized HIV prevention, the national AIDS strategy, and encouraged the Congress to increase spending for HIV uh, domestic uh, prevention programs. And as we discussed last time, then we had the following year sequestration, which hurt our program severely, uh, to to $45 million, and then in FY14. Uh, we received some of that money back, and the president has requested an increase of um, uh, $4.4 million. Still not at the levels that we were back in FY12. Now, yesterday, the Senate Labor HHS Appropriations Subcommittee approved their bill for FY15. Unfortunately, we don't have any details, or very few details, so we cannot report on what um, they re the tomorrow is when it goes to the full appropriations committee in the Senate, and after that they will file the bill and we'll get details of uh, how we did. So there is movement in the in the Senate. We just don't have many details yet. When uh, you look at hepatitis prevention, uh, same scenario. You could see um, there was an increase. Um, then a real cut because of uh, sequestration, restoration of funds. Um, can, you know, you can see, you know, hepatitis is such a worldwide and domestic problem, and the amount compared to HIV is just so small. And we've been working as advocates to increase um, funding for hepatitis at the CDC. We don't know how we've done uh, in the Senate bill. Um, but hopefully in the next day or two, uh, we will get um, that information. Then turning to the Ryan White program, I think we presented the same slide last time, that um, same scenario, there were some increases, prim primarily in the ADAP program, then it was 
severely cut through sequestration in FY13. Got some increases in FY14. Half of the cuts were restored. And then the president proposed uh, basically uh, flat funding most of the Ryan White program, uh, but increasing funding for Part C. And then in this next slide, this uh, the last slide was the overall program. And you can see in each part of the Ryan White program the um, how it has fared over the last couple of years, and then how uh, what the president has proposed in his budget as well. And I would point out that um, Part D, and we discussed this in our previous uh, sessions, the president has proposed to transfer that funding to Part C. We do not know how the uh, Senate has um, reacted to the president's budget. We've been up on the hill a lot, and I would we haven't seen much support for what the president has proposed. So I would be surprised if they went along with the president's proposal. We do have a little information on Ryan White and that in what the Senate has proposed for FY15, and that is for the ADAP program. The Senate is proposing to increase ADAP uh, in FY15 by five million dollars. So it would be up to around nine hundred and five million dollars. We don't have any other information on what they propose for the rest of the Ryan White program. So you know, the overall funding levels have consequences on the ground, and I wanted to share what um, how this has impacted just in the Part A awards uh, for the different jurisdictions in Florida. Now, there's other factors that are playing in this as well. As you know, the Ryan White Part A awards are distributed uh, for the formula part on case counts, and also there's a supplemental as well. We don't have the breakdown of the um, formula versus supplemental yet. Hopefully, um, HRSA will release that soon. Nor do we have the case counts, and of course, for these jurisdictions, of course, based on your case counts, you get different amounts of money. The other factor that played in the change in funding is the end of Hold Harmless. Now, um, Hold Harmless was not in effect for the TGAs, but you, the smaller communities, the transitional grant areas. And most of um, Florida's jurisdictions are EMAs that were subject to the Hold Harmless. And you can see. Uh, that there were um, some significant changes, most of them positive for the jurisdiction in Florida, except one jurisdiction, Palm Beach, has received um, some cuts. So just to walk through, I'm not going to go through every number here, but the um, people could look at their individual jurisdiction. But you can see from, from um, the change from FY12 to FY13, was dramatic for everyone, and that was due mainly to sequestration. But you can see, even though overall funding was cut by 6.6% nationally for Part A awards, Orange County still received an increase. So obviously their case counts are going up considerably in that jurisdiction. Now if you look from um, FY13 to 14, um, almost every jurisdiction received an increase. Well, that, the reason for that is because overall, remember, a lot of the sequestration cuts were restored. And so overall, Part A funding nationwide went up by 4.2%. But you can see that most Florida cities did a lot better than the national average of 4.2%. However, Palm Beach, actually, it must have been due to their um, case counts relative to the rest of the country, their funding was reduced. And then but we really thought the best way of looking at things because of, you know, you just can't compare um, 12 and 13 and um, is because of the sequestration, is to really look at between 12 and 14 um, because of the sequestration. So we looked at the last three years, and you can see that most jurisdictions in Florida are receiving an increase, um, except for Palm Beach that received a considerable decrease. Now, um, overall, I should say that the decrease, there was a decrease in funding for Part A nationwide of 2.6%. So um, you can see 
that uh, most Florida jurisdictions did um, better than um, the losing on average between 12 and 14. I also wanted to fill in what's going on in the two Part A jurisdictions in Puerto Rico. So Ponce, unfortunately, is a TGA. And due to their, um, their um, number of uh, HIV cases, no longer is receiving TGA funding. However, I understand that you know, continuity of care is so important for those patients that they are, uh, HRSA is awarding money to some Part C clinics to make sure that funding is um, continued in Ponce, but it's not going through the Part A. And for San Juan, um, they have been receiving decreases in funding. And so I could report between um, 12 and 13, they went down by 12% by um, 12, in, between, in, in between 12 and 14 percent, their funding went down uh, by around 19 percent. So what does happen at the national level does impact the uh, local jurisdictions. So now turning to NIH AIDS research, um, that you can see that um, for um, the same pattern that we saw some increases, everyone got decreases and uh, basically flat funded the last couple of years with the president's budget. I can report that the Senate overall uh, is proposing yesterday an increase overall of NIH of six, over $600 million. Since the um, AIDS portfolio is around 10% of that, it looks like they would be getting around $60 million. Uh, now there's re uh, increase proposed for FY15. So um, that's better than what the president has proposed. There also, we work every year to get report language in the bill that says that the AIDS portfolio should continue to receive what it's percentage-wise of what we've received in the past. We do not know yet. We'll know after tomorrow if that language is in there. There's been a real onslaught from some groups from other disease groups that HIV is getting too much money, they say, and they don't want to see that increase for HIV. So it will be interesting. I only have the overall number for NIH and not the specific AIDS funding. And then now turning to HOPLA, which is in a different bill, which is moving along in the House and the Senate. Um, you can see that for FY, the President has proposed to increase the program by uh, $2 million for FY15. And the House took a different um, tack, and they uh, proposed to decrease uh, funding for HOPLA in FY15 by $24 million. Well, the bill was on the floor yesterday, and Congressman Gerald Nadler from New York uh, proposed an amendment that would increase that funding to 29, by $29.5 million. It would bring it back to the 2010 level of $335 million. Um, unfortunately, that floor amendment failed by a vote on party line, basically, of 205 uh, votes to 221 votes. So it's pretty close. Um, the Senate has um, proposed their bill, and they are um, proposing to flat fund the program at uh, $330 million. So the next steps will be uh, that bill will go to the floor in the Senate probably in the next couple of weeks, and then it will be conference with the House and the Senate. But very different, um, um, and this is a pattern that we saw last year as well, that um, the House proposed to cut it and the uh, Senate proposed to increase or flat fund. So just in conclusion for this section uh, for FY15, the allocations for labor HHS, the Senate, very different from the House. The HUD appropriation bill, what HOPLA is, is moving along. And uh, Labor HHS, as I said, marked up yesterday. And they will be, um, you know, go into full committee tomorrow. And um, then hopefully we'll see some action from the House soon as well. But I think it will be in the next month. So then just turning to some federal policy changes impacting patients and providers. And I just made a list here, and I think probably everyone is familiar with a lot of these. But I think we now have HHS treatment guidelines that basically say that people, if they're found to be HIV positive, should be on 
offered medications and um, in, 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 in they need to be retained in care. I think, and, and, you know, we also have treatment as prevention. And so I think coupled both of those, it, it just shows that the importance of um, making sure we have mechanisms um, and policies in place to make sure we have both treatment for the people, but medications, but also the, the, the care uh, and the continued care. Uh, we also have routine HIV testing by the CDC, and follow that, we have a, a, a positive grade by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force that says that people uh, it should be offered on a routine basis HIV, an HIV test. We also have a national HIV strategy that's very strong in three areas with you know, three goals to decrease new infection, increase access to care and treatment, and reduce health disparity. And added to that, now we have an, a new initiative from the administration that um, in, in an effort to reach these goals is the continuum of care. I think everyone's uh, familiar with the treatment cascade, but we need to uh, incorporate in all our programs, um, the, the, the Ryan White, and uh, particularly the um, getting people to adhere to their medications and improve that treatment cascade. In previous um, seminars, uh, we talked about health care reform and the insurance reforms no more longer. People can be denied on a pre-existing condition. We have qualified health plans that people can um, get on that offer both care and treatment. And in some states, we have Medicaid expansion, and that was really bringing a lot of people with HIV into care and treatment. And we also, as we talked about before, have coverage of preventive services like HIV testing. And now, you know, in turning to prevention, uh, we also have some new PrEP guidelines from the CDC that offer circumstances where PrEP and offering Truvada um, can be helpful in the means to, um, to prevent the transmission of HIV. And just recently in two hepatitis areas, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recently came out with a new grade, um, a positive grade, for offering um, hepatitis um, testing to high-risk individuals like uh, um, men who are sex with men, people who are foreign-born from jurisdictions that have um, high uh, incidence of hepatitis and some others as well. And we also have a U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendation for hepatitis C as well, that are not only for high-risk individuals, but for baby boomers as well. These both translate into coverage of preventive services, of testing services through the Affordable Care Act. So these are just some policy changes that we thought we'd highlight that uh, impact both prevention, care, and treatment for hepatitis. And so ways you can get involved. So we're very involved in the Federal AIDS Policy Partnership. It brings together both national, state, and local organizations who are interested in federal HIV policy. We have a, a very active listserv. If you would like to be on the listserv, you can go to the website there. And we also meet a couple times a year in Washington. But every meeting has speaker, uh, has calling capabilities, so anyone throughout the country can participate. But I would encourage people to get on the listserv. But also, most of the work is done in work groups. And you can join uh, through an organization um, uh, work groups. And we have one that deals with the budget. Ryan White, Healthcare Access, which is Medicaid, Medicare, and Healthcare Reform, Prevention and Research and Structural, which deals with like housing and food and um, employment issues. And also, I would encourage people to get involved in their national organizations. There's many provider organizations like HIVMA, uh, the Academy of HIV Medicine, and ANAC. They all have federal affairs activities. And also advocacy organizations such as ours, AIDS United, and MAC, which has the U.S. Conference in AIDS. And finally, you know, I think people, if they are experiencing issues with the implementation of health care reform, you could also um, get involved in uh, reporting issues through the Speak Up uh, program. And here is the um, website for that. So also there's hepatitis advocacy at the federal level. And I would encourage people to get involved with the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable. And here is their web address and also the Hepatitis Appropriation Coalition that NASDAQ organizes 
uh, to get money for um, hepatitis programs at the federal level. And here's the contact information. So now I'm going to turn it over to Michael, who's going to talk about state issues. Thank you, Carl. A lot of information. And um, I know we're, we're going uh, fairly quickly, but um, uh, we know your time is precious, and we wanted to get in as much information as we could. And also remind you again, you can reach out to us at any time, um, or if there's an issue you or your organization are working on, and you need additional information to help you either with your project or you just want to make sure in your planning uh, that you're prepared for what's happening in the future, um, you know, shoot us an email and we'll, we'll try to get you the best information and the most current information we can. So um, again, thank you, Carl. Um, so as everyone knows, the, the State of Florida's legislative session is, is over. Um, but we're going to talk uh, just quickly about some things that are happening now. Um, many of you may already know this, um, but we also know that a lot of a lot of folks don't know this um, because if it's uh, discussions about our legislators, if it's not on the news, um, then it appears as if things aren't happening, um, that they're not meeting, they're not working on issues, um, and and that's really not true. In fact, uh, the 2014-2015 legislative session will actually begin officially in September. They're called interim committee weeks, and those weeks are weeks where committees are actually meeting and preparing um, agendas and priorities. Um, they're hearing um, issues. It's an opportunity for us as advocates um, to put our issues forward, um, things that we want to try to uh, complete or um, you know, or if it's a continuation of last year's, last legislative session's work. Um, and in our case, our HIV testing bills, our hepatitis testing bill, um, the syringe exchange pilot project, all of which did very, very well um, through not only the committees, but even um, when, when they were going to a vote. And for various reasons, they didn't complete, um, go all the way through to approval because as we were told many, many times, it's an election year, and these types of things just can't be passed on an election year. So, you know, please come back. Um, and we received a lot of requests. In fact, we're scheduling them now for legislative offices for us to come and provide training to them, the elected officials and their staff on HIV and hepatitis and the, the structures that we're dealing with in healthcare. care. Um, there's a lot of interest, believe it or not, in our Florida legislature on health care. Um, there is a lot of interest even on a Medicaid expansion. But they, you don't hear that publicly. Um, we did hear that a lot on our one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, but it's not a popular issue to talk about publicly, on, especially in an election year. So in, in summary of that, there's, there's a lot of activity going on, lots of opportunity for you to interact with your offices, uh, your your representatives' offices, while they're in their local districts, um, you know, for you to stop by, ex explain what you do, and um, what your interests are, as as we are, and as we do. The other huge issue um, that we were down to the wire on is the the budget. It was finally signed by Governor Scott, um, and the one positive issue. Oh, actually, I should say the second positive issue is the additional $200,000 in general revenue that was, was put into the budget this year um, for hepatitis. And that was not line item vetoed, um, which is actually a win. Um, and the fact that there were no cuts proposed to our existing uh, funding of the funding portfolio that we, we monitor closely that has any impact on um, our HIV or um, hepatitis communities and the uh, Florida Department of Health infrastructure, you know, which we tried to um, get additional dollars restored for hepatitis um, specifically and additional dollars to the um, AIDS Drug Assistance Program to try to help more people uh, receive services and receive uh, treatment that through the um, various programs. Um, that wasn't, you know, that we knew that that was an uphill battle when we went into this session, um, but 
we're going to start that all over again um, for the 2014 and 15 session. Um, so they, they know we're, we're coming and they know um, what amounts we're going to be asking for. So the changes to HIV and AIDS healthcare in uh, Florida specifically, we've talked about this proposed rule change for the Florida Administrative Code uh, 64D. And why are we talking about it? Um, well, normally we wouldn't be. It would have been an administrative process, you know, because as time goes on, um, data gets outdated, um, terms are no longer used, um, federal uh, funding streams change their uh, titles of this, they change their um, uh, CFDA numbers, they change lots of identities. And so the administrative code needs to be updated periodically to reflect those changes. Well, what's different about this proposed change is that there were some changes to, proposed changes to the threshold um, eligibility requirement for HIV and AIDS services at, within Florida, um, th specifically through the Ryan White program, which also includes the AIDS drug assistance program. And our concern over those proposed changes um, sparked not only our comments, but other um, uh, colleagues and patients' comments, organizational comments um, from around the state through the seven workshops that were held um, throughout the state, and to ensure the broadest reach possible for our patients to be able to get into services. And it's really important to note that you know, the Affordable Care Act, although we were very supportive of it and still are, um, had a lot of problems its first year. So it, it wasn't a magic pill. It wasn't, you know, the, the instant um, fix that we needed. And we couldn't transfer patients um, from uh, the Ryan White system into that system seamlessly. And because that couldn't happen, um, thank God we had Ryan White uh, to be able to continue to provide care and treatment for these folks. And there's those services are still being provided, so we still need it. Um, and once the Affordable Care Act is, is to the point where it is more beneficial than the, the current system or the Ryan White system that we have or the, even the Medicaid system, then that's a, that's a different story. But at this point, as you heard from Carl earlier, that's not the case for us in Florida where we rely on uh, federal marketplace plans. Um, and that's the extent of our um, connection to the Affordable Care Act. And this legis upcoming legislative session, as I said before, we will be advocating for Medicaid expansion as part of the Affordable Care Act, um, but that's a completely separate issue to try to create yet another um, safety net for increasing the number of people that we can help um, in Florida. So this Rule 64D, um, those proposed changes, um, are not out yet. They, after the um, seven workshops were completed, um, the uh, Department of Health will have, has or will um, create a draft based on those comments and then put that out for final um, review to the public, and we haven't seen those. So once those are made available, um, we will be sharing them with all of our networks, and hopefully um, you are participating on that because uh, immediate comments are not only necessary, but um, critical to either the success or the failure of those um, rule changes moving forward. So don't ever think that your, your voice doesn't count because it does have a huge impact. And in some cases, um, we've even heard from legislators and, um, and members of Congress that they've They've never received a call or even a letter on an issue um, from their constituents. So that actually has worked against us when um, people don't voice their opinions. So the marketplace um, enrollment period had ended for 2014 for the first, first enrollment, um, which was an extended one. But the next one um, for people can begin enrolling is on November 15th. And as many of you have probably heard or 
seen when this date was changed um, from October 1st to November 15th that it was moved until after the midterm elections. Um, certainly there's probably some strategy around that. But, but either way, that means that our system within Florida needs to be ready. Um, so not that coverage is going to begin on November 15th, but when people are picking their plans, if they need assistance with out-of-pocket costs, then and they're going to rely on uh, another system like Ryan White to help them with co-pays, then, then they need to know that those plans and what the system is that's going to help them pay that. So they need to know what Ryan White's going to be able to pay, if at all. Um, are there certain plans that will be covered and certain plans that will not be covered? The patient needs to know that. The, certainly the case manager or the navigator needs to know that or whoever's helping the patient through it. Um, but those mechanisms have not been finalized in this state. And, and there was, there's a broad attempt to, um, rightfully so, to try to make a statewide system that is seamless when you cross county lines because the plans are not seamless when you cross county lines. Um, there's different plans for each county. Some are very similar. Some are almost identical. Um, but th they don't have to be. And so when we try to create a system um, to collectively that wraps around or supports those out-of-pocket costs for lower-income patients, then you want to make it a, a system that's easy to maneuver, understandable, and is easy to explain uh, to uh, patients and certainly to compare plan one plan to another. So that process of developing that system is happening as we speak. And in fact, um, the Florida Department of Health ADAP program, AIDS Drug Assistance Program, is offering opportunities for different ways of becoming involved. And uh, through uh, workshops, through conference calls, through committee groups, um, to try to have input from a lot of different experts um, and in including patients that use the services um, to talk about what works, what doesn't work, how should there be caps on how much assistance is provided, um, and how is coverage completion going to be the best and, and achieve the best outcome um, for the patient ultimately. So, that's really important, um, and if you get the opportunity to participate, um, we ask that you do um, because we need as many voices as possible. Um, and in, in the end, what our hope is that the um, system that we create will be a model that other states could use, um, but certainly the, the benefits are going to be the best to everyone, I mean, and especially the patients. So, as I said, that enrollment's in November, um, but the, I think everyone's probably heard of at least one person that had a problem with the first enrollment period uh, that began October 1st, um, 2013. So we've created, um, along with a lot of partners, including um, the Florida Caribbean AETC, the, the survey uh, for missed opportunities in care for persons with HIV and AIDS. The survey link is there. If you have not received the survey request by email, um, please check your spam folders. Um, we did get a lot of feedback that those were going to spam. Um, but we can resend it at, at any time. Please share it with your, your colleagues, um, your friends, um, and with uh, any providers that you might have in your networks. Uh, we're trying to gather information about how um, the Affordable Care Act had an impact on um, patients um, in, a, in our areas. And as Carl said, um, we're doing that, um, collecting that information at the national level too. And we, we need this type of real world feedback in order to fix things because this is also how we find ways of um, common problems that are happening not just in our area but in other areas and other states. And if we don't share this information with each other, we'll never get them fixed. So just quickly on the Florida Medicaid Managed Care um, expansion. This does not have anything to do with the Affordable Care Act, um, which we mentioned before that this is 
um, our existing Florida Medicaid program has rolled into a managed care model. Um, and the rollout dates that I have on the screen here are um, the dates that are happening by region. So they're going to roll out the entire state eventually, um, but it's being scaled up. And the website that's listed here has lots of information, not only for you, but for, for patients directly and for certainly case managers and um, people that are helping them get enrolled. Um, so with the program overviews, the snapshots, the regional maps, um, and opportunities for questions. This is another um, opportunity for you to provide feedback to not only um, ACA in uh, Tallahassee, but um, to us so we can help advocate for better um, Medicaid systems. And we've, we've got a lot of great folks that are working in the Medicaid office that really want to make this successful. Um, and if they don't hear about barriers and problems of enrollment, or misinformation that's out there, and we've, we've already collected some complaints um, from the managed care providers that are providing, well, at least misleading information, um, or it's being perceived as being misleading by the patient. So, and that's concerning when you hear that more than once. Um, so those are things that we're, we're passing on and, and, and having them look into for us. And then we have changes within our Florida Department of Health and their HIV and AIDS um, section. Um, last time we've met, that we didn't know who the new administrator was, but now it's um, we do know it's Marlene Lalota, um, who has been with the program um, for many years in the prevention, early intervention section. Um, so we have uh, a lot of trust in Marlene, and we know that she's she's going to be a great leader, and is a great leader. Um, so it's another opportunity for you to, to reach out to Marlene, have a connection um, with her and her staff, um, you know, to try to make our, our systems even better. So there has been significant staff turnover and uh, the loss of institutional knowledge over the past few years because of the, um, primarily because of the Florida retirement system. And when they announced changes to that retirement system, um, only people that were currently enrolled would be protected. So there was a, a large amount of, of folks that um, uh, signed up, and you know, and once those, that five years hits, we start losing people. Um, you know, and you have to prepare for things like that. So, um, and if if that doesn't happen internally, then outside organizations like ours and 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 people from around the state need to make sure that that institutional knowledge is is maintained at some level, and that you know changes aren't being made to our infrastructure um, just for the sake of of changing it, or that people are are trying to make their impact on a program without community input. So they, you know, if if they don't understand how we got to, from point A to to Z, then um, it's going to be hard for them to administer. Um, programs and um, systems in the future um, and make sure that the, the people that helped create it um, are, you know, continue to be part of the solutions. So we're constantly advocating for um, inter interaction between the community and um, the Florida Department of Health. And I think we'll turn it over to um, back to Dr. Beal for, for questions. Okay, thank you, Carl and Michael. We have a um, speaker question and technical support issue box you should be able to see on the screen. And if you would please type your questions for the speaker we're watching, and we will address those to the speakers. And I know some of you folks out there that are signed on are usually quite interactive, so I'm hoping to see someone come up and start typing in some questions. Uh, Michael or Carl, I'll go ahead and start the dialogue. Um, Give us your thoughts on how the upcoming elections might impact our budgets. Michael, do you want to start at the local? Yes. Um, 
we know, we saw this in our legislative session already this year, that um, the governor's election had a huge impact on what the legislators were willing to accomplish. And that's a key word, willing. Um, yes, they could have accomplished it, but they didn't want anything controversial um, that was, could possibly be used as a soundbite um, that would impact um, his reelection. Um, you know, and they were pretty straightforward with us on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, so we're hoping that the 2014-15 session, once we get past the, the, this election and the midterms, um, we'll be able to accomplish a lot more next year. So um, the AIDS Institute does not get involved in uh, partisan or any elections, but um, you know the whole entire Congress. Uh, in the House is up for re-election, and uh, it's anticipated that the uh, Republicans will continue to control that body. A very interesting race last night. The number two Republican in the House lost to a Tea Party person in this primary. Um, so I don't know if that has any national implications, but it just continues to show the strength of the Tea Party movement. Um, and then in the Senate, which is controlled right now by the Democrats, uh, there, there is an, an opportunity for Republicans to actually uh, control that body as well. So uh, we'll be uh, watching. That means that they will turn over all the committee chairs uh, if the Republicans become uh, the, the primary majority party and set the agenda. And uh, therefore, I think uh, debate over the Affordable Care Act will be unending. Right now, you know, the, the House has been passing things and doing things against the Affordable Care Act, but it's been blocked by the uh, Senate. Now, we would still have uh, President Obama in the uh, White House who would surely veto uh, things, but there are sometimes there's things that do get through that, you know, let's say, let's be frank. The, the Affordable Care Act does some changing and some help, but everyone's afraid to do it because it would open it all up, and um, and so that's why there, we have no one gets along up here, and uh, it's just hard to uh, control once you open things up. So um, you know, on the funding levels too, we will. Uh, you know, if the Republicans may, if control the, the Senate, they uh, may have st different priorities. But, you know, HIV has always been uh, a bipartisan issue, and, um, and we would hope that would continue in the future. I think that we'll really see some changes. It would be on the Affordable Care Act. Thank you. It certainly does um, bring to the forefront the importance of getting out and voting. Uh, certainly the election that occurred in the last 24, uh, last 24 hours was reported as having a minuscule voter turnout. And we have a question from an audience participant. How much change do we foresee in the Affordable Care Act as well as, sorry, it just totally disappeared from me. Um, Sean, can you see the question? I was reading and finish it, please. The question is, how much change do we foresee in the ACA as well as funding level for Ryan White Care Act programs? There's a second part to the question, um, and it is, do we have enough bipartisan support to maintain these programs, especially after elections and the imminent lame duck status for the president? Okay, good question. So um, as I said on the ACA, I don't think we're going to see many changes in the ACA. Well, we have been seeing changes is from the administration. You know, they put, they keep on moving some deadlines, um, and actually, you know, there's still some, um, you know, now that we have one year under our belt, and seeing how enrollment went, how the plans go, uh, we have some complaints with the um, some of the plans and some of the high coinsurance that some of the plans are uh, putting on their patients. We would like to see the administration um, put caps 
on um, the co-insurance and the co-payments. We also um, are concerned that there's not enough transparency in the plans, that the patients don't know how much they're actually paying for a drug when it says 50% co-insurance. So we would like the administration to um, you know, make sure they, uh, the plans are transparent. And also, we uh, want to make sure that non-discrimination provisions are enforced. And it looks like some of the plans are, by putting every HIV drug on the highest tier, discriminating against people with HIV. We want that to be enforced. So I think it's going to be more on the administration side to do things. So funding levels for the Ryan Wade Care Act, that's what we work on is, you know, and we need your help everywhere to, you know, to make that, just because we have the Affordable Care Act doesn't mean we don't need the Ryan White program. We need both, particularly in states in Florida that aren't expanding Medicaid. But it's no secret that, you know, 75% of people in the Ryan White program have some form of co-insurance, they have some sort of insurance already, and that we need all the support services that the Ryan White program provides, and we need all the funding for the um, premiums, co-pays, that Ryan White can provide to keep people in health care. And do we have bipartisan support? So far, yes, that we have. And um, I was pleased, I, though I can't report on everything in the Ryan White program, but I was pleased that the Senate um, put in an increase for the AIDS Drug Assistance Program. Um, so they, I think um, they realize that we still need all this funding. Thank you. Uh, Sean, were there any other questions that I can't see? There are not. All right, thank you. Uh, sorry about the technical glitch. Uh, question for you, is there any advantage to meeting with our state legislators during the summer? And um, if there is, are there talking points available that we should have in our hands to go have those meetings? Where would we find them? Who do we turn to? Thank you. That's, this is Michael. That's an excellent question, and yes, there's a huge advantage. One, um, you don't have to travel to Tallahassee to meet with your elected officials. Um, set up meetings with your local offices um, or, you know, do a, do a drive-by, stop-by. Um, and first of all, it, it's a great idea to, to just introduce yourself, um, what you do, what your interests are. Um, and keep a regular um, schedule, a regular drop-in, um, you know, throughout the year so that you're not just going to their offices and using them when there's an emergency or when you've seen an action alert or you want them to do something. Um, because th there's always need for them to draw on experts from their areas um, on various issues. And if they know what your expertise is, they know you, and they've, they've talked to you, then they're more likely to call on you um, when they need something um, or they, they need your opinion or, or your voice. So that's very helpful. But for talking points, um, certainly our website, um, uh, the AIDSinstitute.org or the um, Florida HIV and AIDS Advocacy website, which is FHAAN, FHAAN.org, which is also on the AIDS Institute's website. Um, there's talking points. There are fact sheets. Um, there's, there's quite a few things. And, and in fact, we're going to be working on updated versions um, this summer uh, that we'll be using for visits with the offices and we'll be using um, for the upcoming interim committee weeks. Um, so if you're interested in participating in that, um, please just shoot me an email and we can get you included on those work groups um, that are developing those, those documents. And then one quick plug again to, to uh, point out what Dr. Beal had mentioned about elections. Um, you know, we don't want Florida to, you know, we're constantly a 50-50 state when it comes to any election, um, but we want better Florida to turn out. And we have a great system of absentee ballots and, and mail-in. Um, you can order things online. Um, you can change requests online. There's lots of things you can do to, that you don't have to go and stand in line on election day um, and and that's the only way to vote. So look into it in your area for, through your um, supervisor of elections offices and find out what options you have and, and take advantage of them so that you don't miss the opportunity to vote 
and encourage your family and friends to do the same. Wonderful. Thank you so much.